Number 10, Spider-Man as Pestilence. Yes, that's right. Everyone's favorite web slinger was a horseman of apocalypse at more than one point. But every time he has been Pestilence, it was not part of the 616 continuity. On Earth 5701, Peter goes full spider in his horseman form with four arms and four legs. It's actually really freaky. I do not like it. He, Archangel, and Famine are tasked with going on a merry reality hopping hunt of Cable, which they ultimately fail. In the Earth 10082 reality, he is Pestilence again, but a different kind of terrifying as he is fused with his steed because of the techno-organic virus, becoming all white and hairy and just pure nightmare fuel. He and the other horsemen of this reality go to the mainline Earth to fight the Avengers with Apocalypse. Number 9, Psylocke as Death. In Uncanny X-Force's 2011 The Dark Angel Saga, Archangel was turned into Apocalypse's heir. Using a death seed, Archangel reshaped Psylocke, his lover, as his horseman death. She didn't really stay a horseman for very long, and she didn't get to do a whole lot as Phantom X and an alternate Jean Grey were able to release Psylocke from Archangel's psychic hold. She did get the opportunity to de-life her former lover before he could succeed in destroying the world, so there's that. Betsy Braddock Psylocke is another incredibly strong character, even when she isn't Captain Britain. She's a powerful mutant psychic, being able to produce psionic weapons and blasts. She also has the psychic abilities of astral projection, psionic shadow, telepathic illusions, telepathic detection, mental paralysis, psionic immunity, as well as telekinesis, flight, and force fields. Number 8. Polaris as Pestilence Polaris is actually the daughter of the uber-popular mutant Magneto. And she was also one of the many mutants who lost her powers during the M-Day event, when Scarlet Witch used her reality-warping powers to take away the mutant abilities of a heckin' ton of mutants. In denial of losing her Magneto-like magnetic field manipulation powers, Polaris was visited by Apocalypse, who restored her powers with the celestial technology so that she would become his Pestilence. She got quite the rebranding as Pestilence too. Instead of being anything like her normal look, she got this really, really awesome suit of spiky armor. As Pestilence, she tried to create a new plague that would devastate the globe but was stopped by the X-Men and some other heroes. Still, that armor? So cool. Hold up. Look. I'm not capable of using celestial technology to boost up your power levels, but I can present top 10 videos to you on YouTube. All I ask in return is that you serve as my evil henchman and commit heinous acts in my name. I mean, uh, <coughs> like, like, comment, and subscribe if you wanna. Anyways. And at number seven, the limited series. In 2005, that limited series called X-Men Age of Apocalypse was released, which took place a year after the events of the original Age of Apocalypse. But it seemed to retcon much of the damage the world had taken in that initial story, giving readers a USA that felt very similar to the Earth 616 version. Magneto, who is the acting director of Mutant Affairs, is working to take down any surviving mutants allied with Apocalypse, while Weapon X, aka Wolverine, roams Canada, murdering off any of the villain's old allies and followers. Throughout the series, it's revealed that Jean Grey is alive as well. You'll see in a bit why that is like not really, you know, okay. But, you know, maybe that's just a subjective opinion. And at number six, Murderous. Age of Apocalypse transforms many of our favorite heroes into murderous villains of sorts. This includes Cyclops and his brother Havoc with the latter being far worse than the former. The brothers worked under Mr. Sinister at the breeding pits. Guess what those are. <laughs> and Havoc was known to be utterly psychotic. He would actually go on to murder not only Jean Grey, but his own brother, who he had a deep-rooted jealousy of, only to be ended by Weapon X, aka Logan, by the end of the story. Colossus also does some pretty messed up stuff too. When Magneto's X-Men storm Apocalypse's stronghold in an attempt to retrieve their captive leader and also create a massive diversion, Colossus loses his cool, big time. His sister, Ilya, Diana plays a big role in this. Now for context, in the Generation Next series of the story event, we follow a team of young mutants trained by Colossus and his then wife Shadowcat. Magneto sends the team to go rescue Colossus' sister who has a very special power. She's the last surviving transdimensional teleporter. Magneto intended to use her in order to send Bishop back in time to prevent the timeline from occurring. But during their siege on the stronghold, Colossus loses his crap over potentially losing his sister, which results in him going on a murderous rampage during the battle. Iceman attempts to get him to chill out, pun fully intended, but Colossus smashes him to smithereens. Then when Kitty Pride, aka Shadowcat, his wife, tries to talk him down, she steps in his way, believing that he won't hurt her despite Gambit's warnings. 
And Gambit was right. Colossus ends up killing her. So then Gambit has to put him down. Number 5, William Rolfson. Making his first appearance in Uncanny X-Force number 13, William Rolfson, better known as Genocide, is the son of Apocalypse and Autumn Rolfson. She was afraid that Apocalypse would see their affair born son and look at him as a threat. So Autumn decided to hide and raise William by herself. Not a bad plan. During this time, William had grown into his mutant powers, and even had a bad suit to go along with it, and he was only like 15. The suit is designed to trap him and contain his powers. He kind of looks like a skeleton in a Hulkbuster armor. It's kind of neat, like a Mars Attacks alien. He can generate radioactive plasma, which is a nice touch in a fight. Yeah, you want to go? Hope you like plasma, bucko. Bam! It's also as hot as the sun's core, so it's real good. In the Dark Angel saga, when William and his mom are hiding, Archangel found them. At this time, he was Apocalypse's replacement, so he recruited William. Eventually, William's mom caught on what was going on and gave them hell. Archangel reacted by killing her. What a <laughs> Number four, Margaret Slade. So as a little girl, she straight up watched Apocalypse himself fight a gang of demons, literally cutting them up. She gave birth to Hamilton Slade, and then after that, her second son, Frederick Slade, who we'll get into a little bit. She's very stern and ruthless, as one would assume, being a descendant of Apocalypse and all. Like imagine being a child and witnessing Apocalypse being summoned to fight demons. Like you wouldn't necessarily be the most bubbly of all teenagers after that. I feel like you'd be a bit scarred. She favorited one of her sons a lot more simply because of the fact that he was violent and ruthless as well as her. They both had the bloodlines of Apocalypse. One was just a bit more different, if I can say that. A pretty notable power that Margaret possessed is that she's able to transform the molecules of her hands into a metallic material that she shaped into talons or claws. Kind of like that dude from the Terminator with the metal swords. These are jazz hands. These are gold. I think it's gold, right? These are gold. These are jazz hands. One of the two. Go watch Bring It On. Number three, Frederick Slade. Born as the second child of Margaret Slade, making his first appearance in X-Men Apocalypse vs. Dracula issue two, he's in the bloodline of Apocalypse, and he's too cool not to include. Born in the 18th century, his family was part of the main branch of Clan Akaba. So basically, he was a second born and was physically smaller, so he didn't really get too much attention from his mom. Middle child syndrome, kinda. Pretty mean. She was actually using her time and energy to mold Hamilton Slade. The family was pretty wealthy and spent most of their time in the Alexandria house, aka the cool treehouse meeting place for Clan Akaba. So Frederick, growing up more or less under the radar, that is until Ozymandias came along and saw new potential in him. Ozymandias spent his time watching the members of Clan Akaba as they betray each other and even kill each other just to get closer to Apocalypse. But Frederick Slade, he was a different egg. Ozymandias saw courage, fairness, and compassion inside of Frederick, so he trained him to become the leader of Akaba, and to be donned the title of the fittest. What a great nickname that would be, like, oh Frederick, oh you mean Frederick the fittest? Yeah, I know him, he's my boss. So now he's a descendant of Apocalypse, so he of course has a few tricks up his sleeve. Self-molecular manipulation for starters, which most upper level members of Clan Akaba possess. Also teleportation, but this one is unique to him. Not only can he teleport himself, but he can also teleport objects or people. It makes a cool blink sound when he teleports too. Gotta love the small details. Number two, Hamilton Slade. Okay, remember that older brother, Frederick, that I'd mentioned? Yeah, that's Hamilton Slade. He made his first appearance in X-Men Apocalypse vs. Dracula, issue one. He's a vampire mutant, so no wonder he got all the attention while Frederick sat on the sidelines. He's also got this cool, like, big clan tattoo right on his chest. Dude's not playing around. We meet him in the Victorian era, born into that same wealthy family. He was born inheriting a strong dose of Apocalypse's blood. So, naturally, he was destined to become the leader. It's in his blood, literally. He looked at himself as he would Apocalypse. This guy's a born leader. The members of the clan had to take orders from him if they wanted to or not. He ended up dying at the hands of Dracula, which not a bad way to go out, or not go out. Yeah, he became part of the undead after that and returned as a vampire, as if this guy couldn't get any cooler. So Dracula and his new crew, now including Hamilton Slade, attacked Clan Akaba, killing his own mother in the meantime. And then little bro Frederick Slade came in and killed him. Yeah, he teleported his head away from the rest of his body. Nice touch, super gross. And lastly, number one, Blink. The great granddaughter of Margaret Slade, also known as Clarice Ferguson, 
Hello, Clarice, was the main player in the Age of Apocalypse storyline. Making her first debut in Uncanny X-Men issue 317, she was one of the many mutants that were captured by the Phalanx. She's known to be rather tense and panicky because of her given powers. Anybody caught in the blink wave, which is her teleportation field, would just get shredded. Now I mean like get jacked, like they would get shredded apart, their body just poof, gone. She isn't the best at controlling her powers too. And those powers being able to create teleportation warp portals so she can displace anything and anybody as well. But she also used these portals to throw a weapon back at an enemy. Kind of like in Infinity War during the first New York battle when Strange and Wong used their portals to throw Ebony Ma's brick darts back at him. It's pretty cool stuff. She joined the mutant nation of Krakoa and battled Nightcrawler, which is a pretty sweet issue. Well, there you have it, guys. Look, he's got a lot of children, so I'm sure if I missed any of your favorites, I will get to them eventually, maybe with a part two. I don't know. Number 10, Unis the Untouchable. Unis the Untouchable, what a wild character. An oldie and a goodie. Unis actually first appeared back in the original X-Men run, making his first appearance back in X-Men issue number eight, which after hundreds of X-Men issues, is pretty old at this point. Unis himself is what he sounds like. His mutant powers allow him to become untouchable when he wishes, shielding him completely when activated. This psionic repulsion shield that he can create can be as thick or thin as he wants. Unis, whose current civilian name is Gunther Bane, has also been shown to be capable of reaching through the shield himself if needed, without dropping it entirely. Pretty powerful. It's not so powerful if someone comes and tries to make the shield something you have to deal with all the time, which is how they defeated him the first time though. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we are doing here, if you love obscure X-Men villains like me, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Number 9, Nemesis. This character rose to notoriety under a different name and is commonly referred to and known by that code name. But we can't say it here on YouTube, so instead we're gonna go with this other name. Nemesis, which is also a very AOA name, so yeah. Nemesis is known in the Age of Apocalypse reality for being the son of Apocalypse. At least, mm, the alleged son of Apocalypse. I think we pretty much know at this point. We also don't know who his mother is though, so that's still a mystery. But it probably wasn't the woman we now know as Apocalypse's wife in the main continuity, thanks to modern X-Men books, Genesis. She's also kind of a confusing name for her to have in regards to Apocalypse's and X-Men history, but anyways. Nemesis being an ally and horse of Apocalypse ends up being a major antagonist and problem for the X-Men in this universe who are led by Magneto as Professor X is dead in AOA which is kind of you know would help bring about this whole dread alternate reality of Earth 295 aka Age of Apocalypse. Number 8, Dark Riders. Oh boy, the Dark Riders. What a weird group. No wonder we haven't seen them that much. The Dark Riders are believed to be in humans who for some reason allied themselves with Apocalypse. Seemingly believing in his vision of a mutant dominated world and his ideology of survival of the fittest. I don't know how Apocalypse convinced them that this was a good idea, but they do seem to be pretty into it, I'd say, so I gotta assume that he was just like really persuasive and didn't just straight up threaten them. But still, it's a whole weird thing. The Dark Riders, they're weird. The original roster included team members Foxbat, Gauntlet, Tusk, Hard Drive, Synapse, and Barrage. I mean, I feel like that also just says it all. Listen to those names. The Dark Riders. Number seven, Cassandra Nova. I love Cassandra Nova. With every issue of Marauders I am reading, I fall more in love with this strange and terrifying character. Cassandra Nova is basically Charles Xavier's evil twin, but she's also not a straight up evil twin. She is what the Shi'ar would actually call a Mumadry. The Shi'ar believe that Mumadry are basically evil twin spirits of newborns who must be defeated before said person can be born. So the idea with that is that like basically we all before we were born fought an evil version of ourselves. They serve to represent the exact opposite of everything that we are. So in the case of Xavier, who is often presented as being a pretty good guy, though you know, not always, Cassandra is pretty evil in comparison. While Xavier did successfully defeat her before he came into the world with his telepathic mutant powers manifesting while he was in the womb, because of his own psionic potential, Cassandra herself was powerful enough to survive this and eventually would return years later to fight against Xavier and his beloved mutants. Although in being Charles's twin, she herself 
is also basically a mutant, so yeah. She's a mutant, but she's also mama dry. Number six, Nimrod. If we're talking about the new Nimrod, he is well known thanks to the current era, but even he is still somewhat obscure as an X-Men villain, considering that, you know, he hasn't been around for too long and only appears in a few issues at this point. However, even going back and talking about the more famous Nimrod from the Days of Future Past reality, for those who are not familiar, this could actually still be a version of the character who is considered obscure. The main Days of Future Past reality is often considered to be Earth 811, which is where Nimrod hails from. Here and even in the current main timeline of Earth 616, Nimrod is considered to be a super sentinel, a super advanced mutant killing and detecting machine. So if you thought the sentinels were bad, woo, wait till you meet Nimrod. He's crazy, even though his name is kind of dumb. That's why I love him though. Number five, Harold Leland. Despite having recently returned, Harold is usually someone often left out when it comes to his involvement with the previous villainous group known as the Hellfire Club. Or well, you know, he's kind of more, he's like on the side. Like Harry's there, but maybe in the back. Well, really the Hellfire Club has become two different entities at this point now as well, with one remaining pretty villainous and the other being a somewhat altruistic Krakoan based business known as the Hellfire Trading Club. Prior to Harry's resurrection on Krakoa though, he was a pretty bad guy and member of the Hellfire Club. Back when it was made up of villains, before it was, you know, just about business and mutants and all that stuff. Throughout many of his Hellfire days, Leland was often seen as the right hand man to more well known mutant villain, Black King of the Hellfire Club, Sebastian Shaw. And those were also back in the days when the Hellfire Club just wanted to like rule the world. Although who knows, maybe the trading company does want to rule the world. That would be an interesting twist. Number four, Charles Xavier II, or Charles Xavier II. Charles Xavier II is the child of Mystique and Professor X. Wait. What? Yep, at one point these two had a child together, and in the main continuity too. That happened. Well, we don't really know fully what happened to this child in the main continuity, who I feel like we kind of just forgot about, who Mystique also gave up for adoption. Surprise, surprise. We do know of an alternate version of the character who actually gets a bit of a story in the reality of Earth 13729, where he joins up with his half brother Ray's and basically becomes a villain. So that's the version we're focusing on for this point. Charles Xavier too accidentally kills his adoption adoptive mother when his powers emerge, causing him to seek out his birth mother, Mystique. However, she is no longer around because she has been killed at this point by his half-brother, Raze. Charles too then decides to create his own team of X-Men, believing that the current team has disgraced his father's name, who is also dead at this point. However, he's not a very good guy at all, and instead of inspiring a team of mutants to, you know, be better, he just uses mind control to get them to join him, giving them just enough awareness and control to kind of realize what's happening to them, but not enough that they can actually do anything about it. Yikes, that's really evil, man. That's really evil. Like, he could have just mind controlled and been like, man, you just won't be aware. But no, he was like, I want you to know what's happening. Number three, Venom. Hailing from Earth 16,558 comes this iteration of Venom known as Old Man Venom because, well, its host ends up being none other than Old Man Logan. Along with the other horsemen of Apocalypse, Venom attacked Colossus and his team of young X-Men when they ended up on Omega World. But only Colossus was subdued as the other mutants managed to escape. This freedom for the other mutants didn't last too long though because not too long after the horsemen were able to track them down and defeat them. Fast forward a bit to the X-Men trying to save their comrades and we see Venom thrown onto Old Man Logan who began savagely beating down his fellow X-Men because he was no longer in control of his actions. Venom was defeated when Iceman told Jean Grey to focus on its mind instead of Logan's, leading her to force the symbiote to release Logan. Venom was then quickly frozen by Iceman and after that he presumably died. Check him out for yourself in 2016's Extraordinary X-Men number 8. Number 2, Deadpool. At some point after Apocalypse's return in the 21st century on Earth 16,558, he assembled a new team of horsemen and among its members was the Deadpool of this universe. Alongside Venom and the other horsemen, Deadpool attacked Colossus and his team of young X-Men when they ended up on Omega World, but only Colossus was subdued, as the other mutants managed to get away pretty easily and safely. It didn't take long for him to track down the young team of X-Men though, and they quickly defeated them and just took them captive. When the X-Men invaded Apocalypse's kingdom to try and save their teammates, Deadpool and the horsemen of Apocalypse ambushed them. Deadpool fought Iceman and had his mask partially torn by him, exposing his stitched lips underneath. And using one of his swords, Deadpool cut the sutures off and threw up a swarm of insects on Iceman, seemingly defeating him. Deadpool was then taken down by Cerebro when he tried to escape Apocalypse's domain while Omega World was crumbling and presumably died along with the other inhabitants of Omega World when it actually did collapse. Check out this Wade Wilson in his first appearance in 2016's Extraordinary X-Men number 8. Number 1, Sabretooth. 
back to Earth 295 for our final horseman of Apocalypse for today, Victor Creed, aka Sabretooth. Creed was one of the first mutants recruited by Apocalypse when he began his takeover of North America. Sabretooth was dispatched with the other horsemen to attack Cape Citadel, and after the horsemen secured the facility, Sabretooth was shocked when he learned that his master intended to launch the nuclear warheads. His fellow horsemen subdued Sabretooth until the X-Men on their inaugural mission came to stop them. Sabretooth was released in order to fight in the battle, but he was defeated pretty quickly by Weapon X, aka Logan. Upon the defeat of the horsemen, Apocalypse abandoned Sabretooth, however he was invited back into his ranks just a little bit later on. Fast forward past some sick stuff that you should all definitely check out on your own time, and we see Creed actually switch sides to protect humanity against Weapon Omega, aka Logan, which he was successful in doing by crossing over to X-Factor's dimension to stop Archangel and Weapon Omega from completely decimating the world. Check out this Victor Creed starting with his first appearance in 1995's X-Men Alpha, number one. And at number 10, Altered Timeline. For starters, let's talk about the timeline. When Legion kills Charles Xavier, it drastically changes the way events pan out in the timeline. Without Professor Xavier around, Apocalypse attacks 10 years sooner than he does in the original 616 timeline, with him succeeding and taking over the Earth. Magneto leads a mutant resistance and sends Bishop back in time to prevent Xavier's murder, ultimately undoing the timeline altogether, thankfully. What else? Well, Magneto actually forms the X-Men in this reality, just as Apocalypse begins his war. But they weren't as coordinated as Xavier's X-Men were, and therefore North America defenses who stand up against Apocalypse and his horsemen are seriously lacking. In addition to that, many of our beloved heroes outside of the X-Men are killed or just cease to exist. As for humans, well, Apocalypse initiates something called cullings, mass genocide of humans that leaves millions of them dead. Ugh. And at number 9, Magneto and Rogue. Age of Apocalypse has many weird and twisted moments. Perhaps one of the strangest events to occur in its narrative was that Magneto and Rogue shacked up. The two got married and had a kid. So let's jump back for a second. When the storyline starts off, Gambit and Rogue are still a couple. Gambit, hoping to find a way to physically touch Rogue, brings her to Magneto for help. Of course, the magnetic mastermind is able to find a way to touch Rogue via creating a microscopic field. Now, touch is kind of a big deal for her. So having the ability to get physical with her made Magneto hella appealing. But that's not all. Scarlet Witch, aka Wanda Maximoff, Magneto's daughter, would receive a fatal injury in the series, causing her death. But she was not entirely gone. A piece of her mind was within Rogue, and Wanda had requested that Rogue look after Magneto as her dying wish. So it actually kind of feels a little bit weird because of that, because there's a piece of his daughter in her and they're boning. Rogue eventually breaks the news to Gambit, who then sulks away, lamenting on how it's time for him to be alone again. Huh? I don't feel bad for Gambit in this case. Pretty important in Age of Apocalypse. Moving on to number eight, prequels galore. For almost 10 years, Earth 295 was considered to be a dead reality. But Marvel still took advantage of its popularity and published a variety of prequels that took place in that timeline. Blink, a character who would end up in the 616 timeline, more on that later, would have his own prequel solo four issue miniseries that was primarily set in the negative zone. X Man, the series that had initially replaced Cable during the Age of Apocalypse event, returned as a prequel, depicting a younger Nate Summers. There was even a prequel that followed Corsair, aka Christopher Summers, Scott's dad, returning to Earth to be reunited with Scott and Havoc, aka Alex's brother, titled Sinister Bloodlines. It wasn't just prequels though. An X Men Age of Apocalypse one shot would come out in 2005, followed by a six issue limited series. Speaking of. Number seven, Sunfire as Famine. Not sure if I agree with this horseman role as Famine, but Sunfire's insane control over flame, which is very similar to that of the Human Torch, makes him an easily powerful horseman of the apocalypse. After losing his legs to an attack from Lady Deathstrike, Sunfire was in a state of depression and was even considering ending it all, until Apocalypse showed up. The big weird looking Eternal gave Sunfire his legs back and a large power upgrade in exchange for the servitude of becoming Famine. Oh, and to make it make sense, he gave Sunfire the ability to to make anyone believe they were starving. There we go, now it works. He and Gambit would eventually work together to break free of the apocalypse mind control, and he would go on to join up with the Uncanny Avengers for a little while. Number six, Jeb Lee Famine. Jeb Lee was one of the final horsemen. A group of special horsemen assembled by Apocalypse that would be activated if he were to meet his own demise, and would defend his new body as he got back to power. Jeb Lee himself was a spy in the American Civil War when his unique mutant abilities activated. Jeb has the ability to create bio-auditory cancer by making a rhythmic tapping sound, which he can do by simply tapping his fingers, or as he prefers, with his drum that he carries around. He might look a little bit silly, but to me, he is actually kind of 
terrifying. Imagine this guy walking through a civil war battlefield, drumming while bodies are falling all around him because he is literally giving them a flesh eating cancer. His role as famine makes perfect sense, although I think he would have made an excellent pestilence. Number 5 The Hulk as War Probably one of the most popular characters to ever be the Horseman War, also probably one of the most powerful. The Hulk souped up with celestial power? Yeah. He's a beast. After Hulk escaped from a prison, a boom boom pineapple lodged a piece of shrapnel in his head, which ain't gonna kill him, but will definitely cause some minor discomfort and brain damage. Apocalypse manipulated Hulk into becoming his horseman in exchange for removing the shrapnel. He got a pretty sweet new look too. It was almost silly with the gladiator style black, gold, and red armor. And his giant sword? 1997 baby me would definitely be scared. With the celestial power enhancing him, he was strong enough to nearly send the absorbing man and juggernaut onto the afterlife. The only way this Hulk was stopped was when he injured his best friend Rick Jones, which the sight of snapped him right out of his mind control. Number 4 Angel slash Archangel as Death Warren Worthington III he is such a cool character, but he is incredibly intertwined with Apocalypse. He was the first of the X-Men to be put in the role of death, and set the basis for how almost all the other characters would be manipulated by Apocalypse. A good character who has a heartbreaking thing happen to them, and Apocalypse offers to help them fix that in exchange for their servitude. After Warren had his wings mangled to the point of being amputated, Apocalypse would promise him the ability of flight in exchange for becoming the leader of his horsemen. While he would break free from his control, he would go back and forth from hero to horseman over the years, and even eventually almost became the new apocalypse before being offed by Psylocke. While easily one of the most imposing and popular horsemen, he was not the most powerful character to take up the mantle. Number 3 Death Logan During a space mission alongside his fellow X-Men, Logan was captured by Apocalypse and seamlessly replaced with a Skrull that took his place for a while and infiltrated the X-Men. Forced to fight Sabretooth for the mantle of the horseman Death, Logan gave it his all and defeated his nemesis because he not only knew that Sabretooth would be too powerful with all that power, but he also believed that he would be able to withstand Apocalypse's programming. As the Horseman of Death, Wolverine completed several missions for Apocalypse and fought the Hulk. Meanwhile, the Skrull that replaced him tried to create a rift between the X-Men and their mentor, but was slain by the real Wolverine under Apocalypse's orders. After discovering that their teammate had been a Skrull that whole time, the X-Men found out that the real Wolverine was Apocalypse's Horseman and decided to help him out. Under the control of Apocalypse, Wolverine fought the X-Men ferociously in his death persona, but Psylocke, Archangel, Kitty Pride, and Jubilee helped him break Break free from Apocalypse's control. Now I'm sure you know the drill by now, so check out Wolverine's story starting with 1974's Incredible Hulk, number 181. Number 2, Death, Warren Worthington III. After losing his angel wings during the Morlock Massacre, Warren spiraled and went into a deep, deep depression. This eventually led him to accept Apocalypse's offer of new metal wings in exchange for him becoming the Horseman Death, a role that he would continue to serve on and off again for quite some time. Warren was brainwashed and Apocalypse warped his body and mind into his own Angel of Death upon his celestial ship and place him into his new team of horsemen as death. Warren's skin turned blue and he grew a set of biometallic wings from his back that he could retract and also fire dart blades with a neurotoxin. Not only that though, his new wings could also fly higher, faster, and were razor sharp as well. Apocalypse had the horsemen battle each other to find the leader and death beat them all becoming the leader. As death, Warren fought the rest of X-Factor and captured them and after X-Factor's defeat, the horsemen were sent into Manhattan to wreak some havoc. Warren was shocked back to his senses after Iceman faked his death at Warren's hands by having him destroy an ice skull in the shape of Bobby. After their defeat of Apocalypse, his sentient ship crash landed on their complex and X Factor began living in it. Now Warren eventually left the team but later returned to X Factor as the somber, brooding Archangel, left struggling with the urge to kill due to the influence of his wings. Check out more of his story starting with 1963's X Men, number one. Number one, the final horseman. Comprised of Jeb Lee, a Confederate spy during the Civil War that can transmit cancer as famine, Decimus Furious, a Roman gladiator worshipped and feared as the dark god Minotaur as war, Ichisumi, a Jack Japanese woman with the ability to control insects as pestilence, and Sanjar Javid, the son of the then king of Persia and thief with the ability to transmit terminal diseases at death. These four make up Apocalypse's final horsemen and act as the contingency plan that Apocalypse had prepared in case of any ultimate failure. The horsemen's first test was to protect a recently revived Apocalypse from S-Force, and the X-Force under the command of Wolverine and Archangel led a mission to kill Apocalypse, who relocated to the blue area of the moon, but the team were quickly defeated by the assembled final horsemen. Now in the end they did end up failing though and their master was killed by Phantom X. They reappeared later in service to Apocalypse's newly risen successor, Archangel, who chose Psylocke as death. Check them out for yourself, starting with 2010's Uncanny X-Force, number one. Number 10, Death. 
Death for all of them. We will litter the path to Krakoa with bodies of all those who stand against us. For there is an apocalypse coming. Those are the words of the first horseman, Death. First appearing in Powers of X number four, Death is immortal, obviously. He was sealed away on Araka with his other fellow horsemen, which I will expand on a little later. His mother, Genesis, along with multiple other mutants, made the island of Arako their home, even putting towers up to protect them from the threat of demons led by Annihilation. That unfortunately didn't last very long. The demons ended up destroying the towers and attacked all of the mutants. Desperate to save Arako, Death sent the summoner to Earth. And who is a summoner, you ask? <laughs> well... Number 9. The Summoner The son of war himself, born hundreds of years ago on that same island of Arago, he was part of a group of mutant wizards who referred to themselves as the Summoners. So what could they do? Well, they could summon various creatures of Arako. Bam. Just like that. So while all those mutants were being attacked, the Summoner was sent away to the Amenth Dimension. He was sent to find his grandfather and also carried a portion of Arako with him. His grandfather, being Apocalypse, was needed in order to save Arako. Not bad at all. Being the grandson of Apocalypse must be must be nice. My grandparents were cool, but they were never like a meant dimension cool. They just liked Werther's originals. His powers are pretty interesting. Like I said, he's able to summon and control every dark beast of Arako. Demon elementals, you name it. I mean, in one instance, he actually held one of Cable's bombs as it went off, and it didn't even phase the guy. Number eight, Famine. Also an OG member of the Four Horsemen, Famine is the son of Apocalypse, first in his name to serve. Similarly to the Summoner, Famine had also ended up in the Amenth Dimension. So after his mother died to the hands of Amenth's dark god, Annihilation, Famine and his other siblings were approached shortly after the Omniversal Majestrix Saturnine, who then asked both sides of the war to participate in the challenge of the Ten Swords for victory, and they agreed. Famine is also centuries old, as he is immortal as well. Number seven, War Deathbird. Heir to the Shi'ar's Empire's throne, Khaleesi Nirmani is known as Deathbird, a member of the Shi'ar royal family and the sister of Charles Xavier's one-time lover, Lalandra. She was recruited by Apocalypse to serve as his horseman war after renouncing the throne to her sister, who in turn made her the representative of the Kree Empire. She retrieved the living monolith along with X-Men Bishop for Apocalypse to use in the Twelve. Deathbird and Sunfire as Famine were teleported by Mikhail Rasputin, after Apocalypse's defeat, and she was just kind of left in space. While in space, she began a relationship with the time-displaced bishop, and the two ended up confronting each other over a plan to defeat the rule, and Deathbird was presumably dead after being ejected from the spaceship. She was later seen rescued by her sister, however, she was put directly in prison, as she was seen as a very big threat for the throne. Check her out for yourself, starting all the way back in 1997's Miss Marvel, number 9. Number 6, War the Hulk. At one point in time, the Jade Giant himself was manipulated into becoming one of Apocalypse's horsemen. The Hulk was nursing wounds from a brutal defeat and only agreed to serve Apocalypse if he would remove the shrapnels from Hulk's brain from that previous battle. Under the mental control of Apocalypse, he battled the Absorbing Man and the Juggernaut, but they had been sent by the NWO with Rick and Janice Jones to stop these new incarnation of the Hulk, who was using the power of the Celestials. He nearly killed the Absorbing Man and the Juggernaut, but Rick jumped in and the Hulk swung at him and just injured him terribly. Seeing that crippled body of his best friend caused the Hulk to break free of that mind control and flee in shame, and that was kind of the end of Hulk's time as war. Why not check out what events led up to this by checking out the Hulk's entire story, starting with his first appearance in 1962's Incredible Hulk, number one. Number five, restore mutant powers. Yes, this is different than just imbuing a mutant with new powers. This is if your powers have been taken away from you somehow for some reason. Apocalypse can fix that if he so chooses. Apocalypse does enjoy having his own mutant squad though. It's why he keeps creating horsemen. And his favorite thing to do is find already powerful mutants or mutates and expand their power set to make them terrifying. Terrifying agents of destruction. Warren Worthington with the wings of an angel. Apocalypse inspires this interesting combination of reference and terror. Number four, Age of Apocalypse, Telepath. Apocalypse is obviously, as the name of this arc would suggest, one of the titular characters in this story. This occurs on Earth 295 in a deviated timeline set off when Legion, David Haller, in an attempt to kill Magneto instead, accidentally killed his father, Charles Xavier. Apocalypse here demonstrates particularly strong telepathic prowess. This is an ability he also has in the 616, but it's particularly on display in Age of Apocalypse. Basically, anything you could think of, he could do it. Astral plane? Check. Possession? Check. Alteration? Check. Psionic blasts? Cloaking? Mind link? Illusion? Mind control? Just all the terrifying things. Number three, Ultimate Verse, negating mutant powers. Now, Apocalypse was one of those characters who didn't change too much in the Ultimate version, at least not as radically when in comparison to some other characters. 
But one element that was highlighted, although again it was something he could do, was negate other mutants' powers. Like just stop them from coming his way, you're nullified. How completely demoralizing. That would definitely discourage others from trying anything. You see some of your most powerful members launch their strongest attack and nothing happens. Number two, Omnilingual. One of the things Apocalypse has used his powers for is to master all languages. He can speak any language, all human ones at least, plus celestial. This means he can communicate with anyone. Though at times when dealing with Apocalypse, speech and verbal communication is not always a factor. Number one, Apocalypse Beam. Once more, we must return to the Mongaverse, Earth 2301. Apocalypse here maintains a similar look, but has a more cliche anime motivation. To cleanse the world of the weak, which, okay, accurate, and also to deprive it of all its resources. This Apocalypse was not as strong as his 616 counterpart, and while he could absorb and control machines, and he could grow in size, what he was most known for is being able to shoot energy beams from his hands called Apocalypse Beams. Apocalypse was actually defeated in this universe by the Avengers robots. So yeah, 616 Apocalypse would never. Number 10, War Abraham Kiros. Known as, well, War, Abraham was a mutant with the ability to create massive explosions in his immediate area by clapping his hands, which is done by harnessing the minor kinetic force created when his hands would strike each other. And then he redirected it spatially so that it strikes and affects whatever is in his line of sight, creating an explosive release of force. Abraham was approached by Apocalypse after sustaining some pretty serious injuries and agreed to serve as his second horseman, War, after Apocalypse, you know, fixed him up. After being transformed into War, Kiros Pestilence and Famine battled the X-Factor in Central Park and were unfortunately defeated by Iceman. Fast forward a bit in War, Famine and a new death kidnapped Jean Grey and Cyclops and handed them over to Mr. Sinister who tricked them by disguising himself as Apocalypse. The X-Men and X-Factor sought out the Horsemen and defeated them thankfully. Check out this war starting with his first appearance in 1986's X-Factor, number 11. Number 9, War Gazer. Before becoming a Horseman of Apocalypse, Gazer was permanently stationed alone on NASA Space Station 8 because his mutant abilities made him the only person able to withstand the high levels of radiation. Sadly after the events of M-Day, Gazer lost his ability and it did didn't take long for him to get incredibly sick because of the high levels of radiation. Donning a spacesuit, Gazer decided that if he was going to die, then he was going to die out there in space. However, he didn't actually end up dying at all because just as he made peace with it all, Apocalypse appeared. Apocalypse thrust him into a battle to the death with an Egyptologist for the honor of becoming his horseman, War. Gazer was obviously overpowered, and before he was dealt the final blow, Ozymandias saved him and told him that he would one day repay that debt, as the scribe was planning to overthrow Apocalypse. During Gazer's transformation, Apocalypse denied him any painkillers, stating that the pain was a part of the process of becoming war. Now fast forward a bit and we see the Avengers and X-Men storm Apocalypse's ship, which was his ultimate downfall, because Ozymandias snuck up behind him and drove an axe just through him for not repaying that debt. Check out Gazer's story for yourself, starting with 2005's X-Men Volume 2, number 169. Nine. Number 8. Pestilence Phantom Bats of the Twelve Minds The first pestilence to ever exist, the Phantom Bats of the Twelve Minds, was a terrifying looking mutant that acted as the Horseman Pestilence until the year 1013. While alive and active, Phantom was capable of emitting blasts from his eye with the appearance of red bats made of energy, which would strike his opponents with an incredible force, making them surrender instantly while their surrounding area exploded from the force. He also possessed some pretty sweet wings thanks to his mutation that he used to fly, although it took some work as he had to use his own power to do so. In the year 1013, he and the other horsemen were sent to kill Folkburn Logan, the ancestor of Wolverine, but they encountered the Asgardian God of Thunder Thor during their killing spree. Thor engaged them in battle and killed them all single-handedly before turning against Apocalypse. Now check out this horseman's one-off appearance in 2013's Uncanny Avengers number 6. Number 7, Pestilence Plague. Known as Plague thanks to her mutation, this unknown figure served under Apocalypse of, as one of his four horsemen, Pestilence. What is her mutant ability, you ask? Well, she had an ability known as Virus Touch, which meant she could produce a biohazardous agent from her body that acted as a crippling virus in the bodies of other people. The virus causes physical weaknesses, fainting, nausea, fever, and delirium, and that although it could be treated, the virus was still so potent that even the slightest contact with her skin or a few molecules of the virus clinging to someone's, I don't know, form or something were able to cause an infection. She was saved by Apocalypse during the Massacre of the Morlocks, and from that point on, she served as his horseman. After being transformed into Pestilence, War and Famine battled X-Factor in Central Park and were, you know, defeated by X-Man. After Apocalypse teleported X-Factor on his celestial ship, they battled the horsemen again, and after their defeat, the horsemen were sent into Manhattan to wreak some havoc. X-Factor and the Power Pack battled the horsemen, and Lightspeed knocked Plague right off of her flying steed, and she uh, sadly fell to her death. Check her out starting with 1983's Uncanny X-Men number 169. Number 6, Kandra. 
Now let's switch it up for the rest of this list and talk about some horsemen from some alternate Earths. Hailing from Earth 295 comes Kandra, an immortal being who served as a founding member of Apocalypse's original team of horsemen, alongside some other insanely powerful villains. As a horseman whose exact title is never really stated, she helped attack Cape Citadel in the hopes of using its cache of nuclear weapons against humanity. However, this didn't end up working out because they were stopped by Magneto's X-Men. In their final clash with the X-Men, Kandra went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jean Grey, which was honestly a great mashup because the two are both very powerful telekinetics. However, they were easily overpowered and the horsemen were forced to retreat to New Orleans. This didn't really end up working in Kandra's favor at all because she was killed not too long after by her own teammate, Nemesis. Check her and her story out starting with 1995's X-Men Chronicles number one. Number five, Gideon. Also hailing from Earth 295, Gideon was a mutant with the ability to temporarily endow himself with superhuman abilities, all of which was done by assuming the superhuman energy signatures and their genetic templates of those around him. He was recruited by Apocalypse to be a part of the first incarnation of his horsemen alongside Kandra and some other just insane villains. I talked about this a bit before, but their first mission was an attack on Cape Citadel for the purposes of launching its nuclear warheads on human targets. The other horsemen dealt with the security forces and cleared a path for Gideon to access the command center where he began the camp down for their Armageddon. Magneto's X-Men interrupted their plans and kept the other horsemen busy while Magneto went to take care of Gideon himself. Magneto made the mistake of attacking Gideon head on with his powers, allowing Gideon to duplicate his powers and use them to keep Magneto at bay so he could, you know, continue his work. Gideon, however, did not expect Magneto to selflessly do anything to stop him, which is exactly what happened, as with his magnetic powers at full blast, Magneto caused Gideon to overload and just explode. Check him out for yourself in 1995's X-Men Chronicles number one. Number four, Abyss. Hey, guess what? We're still gonna be taking a look at some of the horsemen from Earth 295. Niles Steiger, aka Abyss, lived a life of mystery before becoming one of the horsemen of Apocalypse. It was said that he was experimented on in Sinister's lab, and after escaping, he killed the horseman Bastion. Rather than having him killed though, Apocalypse was just impressed by that and appointed him as one of his new horsemen. Now who knows if that's true, but at least we do know what his powers are. He is classified as an alpha mutant composed of strong coils and houses a portal to an unknown dimension. And he is able to psionically affect others and draw power from their fear. He was assigned the task of preventing any and all humans from evacuating Maine, however he may have taken this job just a little bit too seriously as he started kidnapping them instead. Guess that didn't bother Apocalypse though because not long after he was tasked with overseeing the interrogation of Bishop, and sadly for him, this did lead to his downfall because he engaged the X-Men in battle and Banshee ripped Abyss completely apart from the inside thanks to his sonic screams. Check out this alternate abyss for yourself, starting with 1995's X-Men Alpha, number one. Number three, Horticulture. Horticulture are such an awesome group of villain ladies. I really hope they do continue to appear for years to come and become super mainstream and not obscure. Like, I wanna see them in the MCU. They deserve a live action adaptation despite being pretty new. They made their first appearance in the 2019 X-Men series in issue number three and are a group of villainous women who plan to take over the world by controlling seeds and crops. In essence, they hope to drastically diminish the human population of Earth to return the world to a more natural state, thereby deciding through controlling seeds seeds and crops as botanical scientists who will live and who will die. Number two, Lucifer. Lucifer is another super old school villain who you may have forgotten about or you never knew about to begin with perhaps. But you know who didn't forget? I didn't forget. I did not forget back when Professor X weirdly implied that Lucifer, as in maybe the devil at the time that he was bringing it up, was the one behind him losing the ability to walk. That happened at one point and I was like, what is happening here? Now, Lucifer is not actually Satan though. He's he's not that Lucifer. He's actually an alien from outer space. I don't think it makes it better. Lucifer is a quist from the planet Quistelium. He originally came to Earth to conquer it, but was foiled by Xavier, so he basically dropped a big rock on him. I'm not joking. That's pretty much what happened. Although initially implied to maybe be the devil, we later learn he is just a super advanced and intelligent alien dude. Though not too intelligent because, you know, the X-Men do defeat him. Number one, Cordyceps Jones. Cordyceps Jones is one of the newest villains to pester the X-Men. He actively fought against the most recently retired roster in the current run, before Forge, Firestar, Iceman, Magic, and Havoc joined the team. Cordyceps Jones, however, only recently went up against the X-Men, having targeted Earth by putting a bounty on it after encouraging people to gamble on its destruction at one of his massive cosmic casinos 
game world. Prior to that, he made his first appearance in the 2017 Rocket series in issue number four, which is also why Rocket was the one to help the X Men with finding Game World and infiltrating it. Thankfully, they had a direct link to him through a team member at the time, Rogue, whose husband, Gambit, is a fellow friend of Rocket's through their shared love of gambling. We also learned in their pursuit of Game World and Cordyceps Jones that Gambit's secret nickname for Rocket is Small Blind. <laughs> Cordyceps Jones might be newer in the comics, having appeared in less than 10 issues at the time of this recording, but he's actually an ancient threat, being over 30,000 years old and also being a giant parasitic fungal spore. He and obscure wolverine villain Spore actually could probably do some crazy damage should they ever team up. That would be pretty wild. If you're watching this and you're from Marvel, make that happen. That sounds like a cool team up actually. And now we know Spore is maybe alive. Number 10. Famine Rory Campbell Dr. Rory Campbell was a psychologist who was good friends with the scientist Maura McTaggart. He worked with her for a while on Muir Island during the time that the mutant team Excalibur was stationed there. However, getting to that island was no easy task because of a huge storm that almost killed him. He was rescued by none other than Rachel Summers, and from there on, he was somehow able to discover the existence of an alternate universe where he was known as the mutant hunter Ahab. Determined to do whatever he could to prevent this from happening, he worked alongside Excalibur to capture villains. However, this ended up costing him his legs thanks to the villain Spoor. Scared of his quote unquote destiny, he left Excalibur and took up a position where he was helping mutants instead. An unknown amount of time later, and for reasons no one really knows, he was captured by the villain Apocalypse and transformed into the horseman called Famine. In this capacity, he fought the X-Men but managed to escape before Apocalypse was actually defeated. Check him out in his first appearance in 1993's Excalibur number 72 or skip on ahead to his time as Famine in 2000's X-Men volume 2 number 96. Number 9 Famine Autumn Rolfson Growing up a mutant in Cleveland, Ohio, Autumn struggled with an eating disorder and was in and out of hospitals pretty frequently. She struggled so much because her mutant ability would disintegrate food so needless to say eating was pretty tough for her. She felt alienated from not only the world but her parents as well and Apocalypse used this to his advantage. One day he waited in a room and told Autumn that she could get revenge on her parents and those who hated her. She agreed and was teleported away to his ship where Apocalypse made her his horseman Famine. During their first mission the horsemen were torn not wanting to take orders from each other and battled X-Factor in Central Park where they were defeated by Iceman. After the fourth horseman Death was revealed, Apocalypse had the horsemen battle each other to find the leader and Death beat them all and was chosen as the leader. Later on Famine battled Marvel Girl and easily defeated her and as a reward Apocalypse teleported her to America's farm belt so she could just disintegrate the crops and cattle, but was soon after defeated by Captain America. She later appeared alongside War and a new death, where they kidnapped Jean Grey and Cyclops and handed them over to Apocalypse, who was actually Mr. Sinister in disguise at the time. The X-Men and X-Factor sought out the Horsemen, and though Famine took out Beast, she was quickly beaten by Quicksilver. Presumably now, Autumn has since reverted back to her normal self and was sent back to her parents in Ohio. Check her out for yourself in 1987's X-Factor number 12. Number 8, Famine Sunfire. Shiro Yoshida, aka Sunfire, became Famine after they were presumed dead after Rogue accidentally absorbed all his memories and powers. In actuality, Shiro was taken to a hospital and kept under watchful guard by members of Clan Yoshida and the Hand who were trying to convince him to accept a prosthetic limb. He received a visit from the newly resurrected Apocalypse who gave him an enticing offer to join him in quote unquote saving mankind in return for which Apocalypse would restore his powers and his lost limbs. Shiro agreed, however during the process of being transformed into Famine, Shiro's heroic side returned and he knew what he was doing was wrong. He struggled with his choice and thought about escaping but he didn't want to leave the mutant Gazer to suffer, who was also being turned into a horseman at the time. Shiro finally decided that he couldn't let Gazer suffer more and tried to save him, but he was too late and they were both turned into horsemen of Apocalypse. During his time as Famine, Shiro attacked the X-Men using his flares to give their eyes and brain imagery that made them feel like they were starving. During the X-Men's battle with Apocalypse, Gazer as War was killed while Gambit as Death and Polaris as Pestilence were captured. Despite Apocalypse being defeated and having escaped, Shiro was still under his mental control and tried to save his former horsemen from the X-Men. Why not check out Shiro's story for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1970's X-Men, number 64. Number 7, Jack Starsmore. Making his debut in X-Men Apocalypse vs Dracula issue 1, Jack Starsmore was actually born into a lesser house of the clan Akaba. See, part of the Starsmore bloodline, he wasn't treated with too much respect. The person that gave him the hardest time was Hamilton Slade, his cousin, who I'll talk about in one minute. He had a pretty unique mutation that made him stand out from the rest. That being, he can breathe fire. Yeah, he's a pyrokinetic who straight up shoots fire out of his mouth. Guy must kill it at parties. Oh, and he can also absorb fire too with his mouth. So if anything lights on fire in your kitchen, maybe you're cooking something and there's a pff, little plume of dust, Jack Starmore can just 
suck it up. He was a child when he was deemed a servant to the council and realized he was a small fish in a very big and very overpowered sea. He had to make up for this lost strength, so he would always go above and beyond his duties to make sure everybody around him is happy and safe. We love him. Number six, Evan Sabinor. Sounds pretty familiar to uh, in Sabinor. Well, that's because he's his clone. Yeah, making his first appearance in Uncanny X-Force issue seven, seven, Evan was created from the blood of a fallen young apocalypse after he was killed by Phantom X. So once Warren Worthington became the Horseman of Death, Archangel, he actually was on his way to replace Apocalypse. Phantom X used that small bit of blood and combined it with the world. The world being a scientific facility that's the size of his palm. And he made a clone of N. Sabinur. Not a bad secret at all. Phantom X finally revealed the secret project and used the clone, Evan, a good guy at heart, and he sent him after Archangel. It worked because while they were fighting, Psylocke was able to come in and attack him with the seed of life. Up next at number five, Sugar Man. Speaking of Ileana, the mission in which Generation Next attempt to go save Ileana results in a bunch of casualties. Colossus essentially ditches the entire team, leaving them for dead. But none of them are ever to be seen again. Oh, at least, you know, until like 10 years after the fact and retcons and whatnot. There's a whole thing about it. But let's talk about Ileana's captor here for a sec, the Sugar Man. The Sugar Man is anything but sweet and delicious. He is a disgusting, monster-esque creature who has been keeping Colossus' sister as his slave. He is a unique creation to Age of Apocalypse, having first appeared in Generation Next issue 2 back in April of 1995, and he likes to regularly torment his human slaves. A student of Mr. Sinister, he's a geneticist placed in charge of the Pacific Northwest's human slave camp called Seattle Core. One of the young members of Generation Next, Mondo, is personally killed by Sugar Man during their rescue mission. Actually, quite a few of them are. But that wasn't the last that we would hear of Sugar Man, unfortunately. We're on him in a bit. Moving on to number four, Psylocke. Pretty much every major X-Men character appears in Age of Apocalypse, except one. Psylocke. While she would later appear in the 10th anniversary X-Men Age of Apocalypse issue 4, the character was completely absent the first time around, and there has never been any indication as to where she was, who she was aligned with, etc. Now we do know that she had some sort of past connection with Wolverine aka Weapon X of that reality, but it's still a big mystery as to what the mutant was up to during that time. Psylocke was introduced as one of Apocalypse's horsemen though in the Fox feature film Age of Apocalypse, played by Olivia Munn. Up next, number three, Cyclops and Wolverine. During Age of Apocalypse, there were various different titles during the story event that came out to replace ongoing X-Men titles for a brief period of time. Now, one of these included Weapon X, the name of Wolverine on this Earth. Weapon X would briefly replace the Wolverine series during the event. Now, in this reality, Logan and Jean Grey are lovers, working for the Human High Council, the leadership of remaining humans. The Council wanted to bomb the crap out of Earth, something that the two opposed. Anywho, Mr. Sinister, one of Apocalypse's servants, gets the idea that he can create a mutant powerful enough to defeat Apocalypse by using Jean Grey's genetic material and combining it with Cyclops's, who is also an agent of Apocalypse. Jean is then captured, so naturally Weapon X goes to rescue her. But in the process, he encounters Cyclops, which results in one of the most brutal fights that these two rivals have ever had. Logan loses a hand, and Cyclops loses an eye. Once a rival, always a rival. And at number two, out with a bang. You know how we mentioned the Human High Council earlier? Well, they're a fun bunch. In contrast to Magneto's X-Men, the extermination of all mutants is totally a viable option for them when it comes to getting rid of Apocalypse. And they also supported the Human Underground Resistance, although secretly. Anywho, the Human High Council decides that they are going to be rid of this threat by bombing the crap out of the planet with nuclear bombs. Fun. Their plan is to get Jean Grey to hold these nukes back just below orbit. But before she can do that, she's killed off by Havoc causing their plan to backfire, just as Bishop is about to correct the timeline and stop Legion from killing his father. This pretty much destroys the timeline altogether, with the series ending with Magneto, his son, and his wife Rogue watching the incoming blast, eventually being incinerated within the glowing light. And finally, in at number one, Timeline Escapees. Despite the timeline being destroyed, some of the characters from Earth 295 managed to get out of that timeline, jumping ship to another. Well, the main continuity of Earth 616. Now, this includes Sugar Man, unfortunately, who, during the climax of the series, would shrink himself down, one of his abilities, and pop himself into Colossus's boot, waiting for the opportunity to get the hell out of there. Dark Beast, an evil version of Beast, escaped, along with Blink, Holocaust, and Nate Gray, the Earth 295 version of Cable. Nate would 
go on to die briefly after teaming up the X-Men and Spider-Man, but was eventually resurrected, becoming a member of the New Mutants. Blink would go on to lead the Exiles team, hopping around different realities. And Sugar Man stirred up some trouble, of course, having helped the nation of Ganesha become powerful by enslaving mutants. And Dark Beast was sent 20 years into the past of Earth 616, a fact that was later used in retcons in order to have him be the one who created Morlocks. He would go on to join Norman Osborn's Dark X-Men and seemingly die, only to reappear during the 2017 Secret Empire story arc. Number 10. Merged with Celestial Tech so Apocalypse has merged celestial technology into his body, which has vastly expanded his already ample abilities. He was born powerful and left to die for the fact that he looked deformed to his Egyptian tribe. Grey skin, those blue lips, but he was found in the desert and did not die and soon became aware of his powers. And he also developed his sense of supremacy, especially because of the fear his innate intelligence and athleticism garnered, nothing to say of his abilities. So he came to believe that not only should the strongest survive, but that only they were worthy to. It would be in 1050 AD that Apocalypse would encounter the Celestials. A ship crashed, and recognizing a fellow immortal, the survivor befriended Apocalypse and offered him a deal, the chance to use their technology to shape the destiny of the world, an offer that Apocalypse of course accepted. Number 9. Technopath The reason that Apocalypse was able to merge this alien celestial tech with his body so easily is because he is a technopath, and that means he has the ability to interface directly with technology on an organic level. Both merging as one. It's also part of why he could not only survive, but conceive techno-organic viruses. So Apocalypse can mentally link to and control most technology out there. Because of this, it sometimes makes it difficult to tell which of his abilities are innate and which are the result of augmentation. Though some would argue that at this point, does it really matter all that much? Not to the people he's oppressing, probably. Unless it can be used against him in some way. Number 8. Complete Molecular Control this means that Apocalypse can will his body to do essentially anything. He can change his size, growing to terrifying heights. He can change the viscosity of his body as well, making himself malleable or like putty. This means he can also heal or regenerate, so if anything is chopped off or the like, no problem. It's rare for people to get close enough for that, but it does happen. This molecular control also leads into another ability. Number 7. Generate Mutant Powers Apocalypse can now generate powers to add to his already huge arsenal. It renders him very godlike. Indeed, in some other timelines, he is worshipped as such. Some are unclear if this ability to acquire or rather replicate powers is one that comes from his own mutant abilities or again from that celestial tech. And again, either way the result is the same. Terrifying. He has so many powers it must be hard to even distinguish them. And it also means that if you go up against him, he can throw anything at you. Number 6. Healing Blood not all of Apocalypse's powers are doom and gloom. His blood has the ability to heal, but only other mutants. In fact, his blood is toxic to non-mutants. They get a dose of it, dead. They just can't handle it, there is too much going on. Apocalypse can also imbue others with powers, but he doesn't necessarily need to do that via blood transfer. He has other means. He really is just on a whole other level. Number 5. Pestilence Polaris Before becoming Pestilence, Lorna Dane aka Polaris was classified as an alpha level mutant thanks to her ability to manipulate magnetism much like Magneto can. After the House of M event, she actually lost her powers and this is one of the reasons why Apocalypse was able to convince her to join him. She was dropped inside of Apocalypse's Sphinx by Dap and Apocalypse made her an offer of power in the form of becoming one of his horsemen. Now initially she refused, but eventually she was tempted enough to actually accept the offer. As Pestilence, Lorna had celestial technology grafted to her spine by Apocalypse, which somehow reactivated her X-Gene and her powers. Mind wiped, she ingested viruses from the World Health Organization and was attempting to create a meta plague. In the climactic battle between the X-Men, the Avengers, and Apocalypse, Wolverine discovered the choking pestilence was Lorna herself. Havoc was able to resuscitate Lorna, having given a serum to protect him from the diseases present. She was recovering in the X-Mansion when Gambit and Sunfire returned to take her away. She arose and refused to go with them, and Polaris decided to leave that night to search for Apocalypse in Egypt. She went alone and was later hunted until Havoc and the new X-Men team saved her. Why not check out more of Lorna starting with her first appearance in 1968's X-Men number 49. Number 4. Pestilence and Death Caliban. Having always been a weaker mutant, Caliban took Apocalypse's off to become a horseman because it meant that he would get a significant boost in power. He used his natural mutant gifts to help Apocalypse hunt down other mutants and under the name Death turned on his former allies Cyclops and Jean Grey and the rest of the X-Men. Later on we see Caliban return as the horseman Pestilence and he continued to do what he did best and track down and captured Cable and his alternate reality brother Nate Grey. Eventually he was defeated during battle with the X-Men when they were teleported away by Mikhail Rasputin. Subsequently Caliban tracked down Cyclops who had merged with Apocalypse 
Apocalypse and who was struggling to keep the Eternal Mutant's essence in check. Apocalypse's psyche became dominant and released Caliban from his service. By that time, Caliban had once more begun reverting to his original naive self and his intelligence faded until he possessed only a simple animal-like mind. Now all in all, Caliban remained a loyal horseman until his master turned on him for his constant failure. Check him out for yourself starting with 1981's Uncanny X-Men number 148. Number 3. Storm as Famine. This choice is actually going to be from the pretty awful X-Men Apocalypse movie, which oddly had a really good version of Storm. She may not show just how powerful she is in the movie, but in the comics, Storm is an Omega level mutant and as such is incredibly powerful. Storm has the ability to manipulate the weather and can view the world in patterns of energy rather than matter. Storm also has an innate connection to the earth itself and can feel disturbances in the atmosphere and the magnetosphere. Some of her strongest feats include causing a monstrous storm over the northeastern US while frozen, which could be felt from even the East Indies, manipulating the elemental forces of Trion to seal a hole in time and space, and creating a kind of primal storm that sculpts sculpted the face of the planet. So yeah, Storm is one of the potentially strongest horsemen of the apocalypse. Number 2. Sentry as Death Sentry is one of those characters Marvel created as one of their own versions of Superman. Flight at faster than light speeds, super strength that vastly rivals the Hulk's, superhuman speed that allows him to catch bullets, he is basically invulnerable unless he allows otherwise, superhuman stamina, agility, and reflexes, he is essentially amortal, and unlike Superman, he possesses photokinesis and an even more powerful dark side version of himself known as the Void. He is an unbelievably powerful character, while also being an incredibly emotionally unstable one. He was de-lifed in the siege event only to be revived by the Apocalypse Twins. And as you can imagine, as the Horseman Death, he was absolutely terrifying. Because of the sheer level of his power, he was able to free himself from the Horseman brainwashing, and would seek out Doctor Strange to help Sentry become a hero yet again. Number 1. Wanda Maximoff as Famine Sentry almost almost took this number one spot, but what's more powerful than a super strong Superman like character? How about a character that could just will him out of existence entirely? The Scarlet Witch appeared as a horseman from that same reality that we see the terrifying spider horseman that is fused to his steed emerge from. And guess what? She is also incredibly terrifyingly fused to her steed as well. Coming from Earth 10082, we don't really get much or honestly any backstory for this character. And in her fight, she uses her usual standard magic magical blasts instead of just poofing the Avengers away. But we know she can do that, and much, much, much more, making her, in my opinion, the most potentially powerful horseman of the apocalypse.